Good evening again, everyone. I think we will start now, although there are many people who signed up who still haven't got here. We'll just hope, inshallah, they'll make it. So, salam alaikum to you all. And many thanks to Aramco for sponsoring this lecture. They're sponsoring three lectures for the Prince's School. It's wonderful to have as our first lecturer the internationally renowned calligrapher Nuria Garcia Masib. And I'm proud to say she's an old friend of mine. We go back over 20 years. Indeed, when taking students from the Prince's School on a field trip in, in the late 1990s, I think I mentioned this before, we were in Fez, and I happened to catch um, Nuria in a beautiful position with her master being taught calligraphy against a Maghribi arch. And I've now immortalised her in my book on Islamic gardens. <laughs> But Nuria is a Spanish calligrapher belonging to the Ottoman school of Islamic calligraphy. She's studied for the past 20 years with some of the greatest masters of these schools and holds her diploma, her ijaza, in Thulus Nash, sorry, scripts from Masters Muhammad Zakaria, Davud Bektas and Hassan Shalabi. She's won many prestigious prizes in international calligraphy competitions exhibits internationally has, and gives workshops and conferences in many different countries. And in fact, whenever I see her, she seems to be about to catch a flight somewhere in order to receive some amazing prize. She's currently based in Paris, I expect many of you know, where she teaches regular calligraphy courses and, and engaged in different calligraphy activities. Indeed, her uh, students are so loyal to her that many of them follow her around the world. I think we have someone here from Canada and also someone from Paris has come over. And Nuria is also, besides being incredibly energetic, I mean, mashallah, she, do, she does so much, but she's also studying for an MA at the Sorbonne, which will become a PhD, inshallah. But it's a very interesting subject. The title is The Origins of the Levha, of the Levha. Research into the origins of mobile calligraphic panels. She might might mention something about it later, but I don't want to talk too much about the art of calligraphy because Nuria will tell us about it. She focuses on the methods of transmission, which is so incredibly important for the students at the Prince's School, particularly because the whole idea of the master-apprentice relationship and also this integration between practice and theory which one could say that Nuria is a walking representative of. She carries, she, her traditional art, it, her art is at such a high level that besides abiding by the traditional rules, because of this combination of technique with experience, she is able, I, I understand, she'll tell us more very carefully and respectively to not only abide by the rules and produce extraordinarily extraordinary calligraphy but also is able now I think to introduce some of her own ideas I hesitate to use the word innovation but I don't think that's quite the right word but in any case I'll hand you over to the master herself please Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamu alaikum and welcome uh, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for your <laughs> very generous and kind introduction. I would like to thank the Princess School of Traditional Arts, Emma, for their invitation to deliver this lecture, which actually maybe some of you were here three years ago. I delivered a similar lecture on a topic which I think is very important. As you know, the art of Islamic calligraphy is considered to be one of the foremost expressions of Islamic art. From the early days of Islam, the need to write down the Holy Quran in the most beautiful way possible gave way to a myriad of scripts and writing techniques which were developed and refined throughout the centuries. So the spread of Islam throughout a vast geographical territory expanding over three continents, we're talking from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Muslim Spain all the way to Southeast Asia, and the adoption of the Arabic alphabet to transcribe many different languages and texts contributed to the incredible richness and variety of this art form over a period of 13 centuries. So although we have a series of academic studies and, and some, some books which are quite good on the art of calligraphy and which look at the art of calligraphy from different aspects, bearing in mind the enormity 
of this uh, field. And remember the three continents, 13 centuries, a lot still has to be done. And as a calligrapher and as someone who has been a student of this art for more than 18 years, I think it's our responsibility to dwell on some of the aspects which are not touched upon uh, so often. So I would like to focus on the praxis of calligraphy, how this art is transmitted, how it is learned, and um, how it is practiced in, in its classical form. How does the student attain mastery? Uh, which is one of the very important questions. Bearing in mind, again, this large uh, ocean, this vast ocean of calligraphy, the methods of transmission, of course, vary a lot from one area of the Islamic world to other. However, we can distinguish three classical schools, which are still active today. And, um, and there's some debate about this, but <laughs> just to reduce things a little bit, let's say, the Arabic school of calligraphy with its center in Baghdad and Cairo as well. The school of Persian calligraphy with its center in Iran and what used to be the former Persian empire, so Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Mughal India. And then, of course, the Ottoman school with its center in Istanbul and which continues to have a very strong influence in, in the Arab world as well. So... I will talk about the methods of transmission which are shared in these three schools and which are characterized first and foremost by the master-student relationship. Secondly, by the assimilation by the student of the rules of calligraphy, which are based on harmony and proportion. And finally, of course, the now famous calligraphic license, the ijaza which ensures the continuity and the transmission of the art. And it's worth mentioning that the ijaza is the same term we use uh, for the license which is given in other Islamic sciences. So this gives you an idea of the status of calligraphy in Islamic art. So going back to the central role of calligraphy in Islamic art, the art of calligraphy is directly linked to the revelation of the sacred book. Here you see a very beautiful calligraphy piece by Osman Özce. He's a contemporary calligraphy calligrapher uh, in Istanbul. Ikra, which correspond to the first words of the revelation. So, as Jean Michon says in Lumière de l'Islam, in the first words of the sacred book, in the first words of the revelation, in what they say and in the way in which they are said, we already see the presence of the art of Islam. So, read in the name of thy sustainer who has created, created men out of a germ cell. Read for thy sustainer is the most bountiful one who has taught men the use of the pen, taught men what he did not know. So in these Quranic verses, we see that the art of reading, otherwise known the recitation of the Quran, and the art of writing, calligraphy, present themselves as the two major central arts of Islam. So it is in, the, in this direct connection with the sacred book that makes calligraphy occupy one of the highest uh, levels in the hierarchy of Islamic arts. It is considered a noble art. And as you can imagine, the process of teaching this art is hence a very, very serious task. It's not to be taken lightly. And we will see in the methods of transmission that the spiritual elements and the artistic components will go hand in hand. So the methods that have been followed throughout the centuries, they aim towards giving the student not only refinement of writing, but also refinement of the soul. So I wanted to start with a very uh, wonderful poem uh, from Mirali Heravi from the 16th century which is written by most students in the Persian calligraphic tradition. And it encapsulates the qualities needed to be a good calligrapher. So here's a, a not very good translation. The Persian, of course, is very poetic and beautiful, but it starts, there are five things without which becoming a calligrapher is an impossible task. Sharpness of spirit, knowledge of calligraphy, to have a good hand, 
to endure suffering, this one is very important, and to use the best tools and calligraphy materials. If amongst these five things, one is missing, even if you practice for a hundred years, it will be useless. I, I think all calligraphy students can identify immediately with this poem. We find another description of the qualities needed to be a good uh, student in Kalem Guzeli, another treatise, more recent treatise by Mahmoud Yazir. And according to Mahmoud Yazir, the student should have skill and talent, follow lessons from a teacher, Meshk Gormek in, in Turkish, have a sense of purpose, show intelligence and understanding, and here it would be the, the equivalent of the sharpness of spirit, be humble and decisive, and finally, again, use quality materials and in enough quantity, write a lot, and analyze and examine the writing models in depth. So, as you can see in both traditions, we see the importance of character is put on the same level as the more obvious qualities such as skill and talent, and as well as the need to develop one sense through repeated practice. As the last line of the Persian poem underlines, one cannot go without the other, even if you practice for a hundred years. <laughs> so in order to foment these qualities that of, of course they can all be acquired and learned, the role of the master uh, will play a key role. So as I said, the system of learning is based on this relationship between the master and student. It is not fixed on a standard amount of time or on a fixed quantity of texts to be written. As you will see, there are certain texts which everyone has to write, but after a certain amount of time, it can vary greatly from one teacher to another and from one student to another. Some students may acquire their calligraphic license, their ijaza, after four years. Some students may acquire it after 20 years. So it is a student who chooses a master and requests to be admitted as a disciple so it is a student's desire which creates the impulse to start. It is never the master who advertises his classes. Yeah? So it's a student who has to search, has to go, has to knock, has to, and sometimes it will be, sometimes it will be harder than others, but in general, the teachers will always accept the students because the art of calligraphy in itself is so difficult that slowly the students who are not serious will abandon and the ones who are serious will persevere. So throughout the learning process, the students will develop a very re close relationship with their master, observing his every move and following his guidance very closely. And there's a very beautiful saying by Sheikh Hamdullah, who's one of the old Ottoman uh, masters, one of the, he's considered the father of the Ottoman school of calligraphy. And he said, when someone asked him how the art of calligraphy was learned, he said, I fixated my eyes on the hand and the column of my teacher, my ears on his tongue, my heart on calligraphy, and my hand on the column. Until I understood how a letter should be written, I wrote it over and over again without giving up. And as Mahmoud Yazid points out as well, the writing is hidden in the teachings of the teacher. So when the student has chosen his teacher, when the teacher has accepted the first thing the teacher will do, the master, is to cut the column for the student. And I would like to read another poem by Ibn Bawab, one of the very old masters who codified the cursive scripts, 11th century. O oh, you who want to write a calligraphic hand and desire to write and draw the letters well, if you are truly desirous of mastering the art of writing, Pray that your master make it easy. Prepare a column that is straight and strong, capable of fashioning elegant writing with craft. If you propose to nib the column, aim at applying to it the greatest symmetry. Give the part of the column that is nibbed a moderate size, neither too long nor too short, and make this split precisely in the middle of the column. Look at both ends of it, and then nib it at the end where it's thin and narrow. And this is already in the 11th century. You see how specific description of cutting the column. The master will then write the first 
lesson for the students. And now I don't want to go into too much detail of the different scripts, but this is an example of the Thuluth and the Nesir script. And traditionally, the master does not start with the letters, but with a prayer. Rabbi Yasser wala tu'asir. Meaning, oh my Lord, make it easy and make it not difficult. Oh my Lord, may it finish in goodness. And this prayer, which obviously, once it's written, the master will put all the nocta measurements. This is the system of proportions uh, for the letters, which is what we learn as, as students of calligraphy. So the student will take this lesson home and practice it, perhaps for one week, and then come back, see the master, show the lesson, and receive corrections. And this will happen many times. Traditionally, the students would write the Rabbi Yasser for a minimum of 40 days. And as you know, in the Islamic tradition, the number 40 is very symbolic. We have the 40-day spiritual retreat and so on. So 40 days is a number meaning a, a long period of time. But I think, and here I forgot to mention, we have two very renowned calligraphers, Soraya Said and Ulnaz Mahbub. We studied together in Istanbul, and I'm very happy that they're here tonight. But I think we all wrote the Rabbi Yasser for quite some time, <laughs> much more than 40 days. Yeah. So this prayer serves as an initiatic trial of sorts for the calligraphy student. So the difficulty of writing the sentence at the very beginning, as you can see all these different proportions, new shapes, the ink, the kalam, the paper, it makes this lesson seem like a mountain, impossible to climb. But at the same time, it's a prayer. So the, the, the student is becoming more and more conscious that without the aid of God, it will be impossible to continue. So I, I would like to tell you the, the very well-known story of one of my teachers, Hassan Chelevi. Um, he is in the lower corner on the left. When he studied with the great Hamid Aitach, he went to Hamid Aitach and Hamid Aitach, normally he wouldn't talk to his students when he check lessons. He just wrote the Rabbi Yasser, gave it to him. And then Hassan Hoja went home. He practiced. He went back. He got corrections. He went home. He practiced. He went back. We never write in front of our teachers. Eh? So the practice is a very solitary practice. Then you see your teacher, you receive the corrections, you go back. And this went on for two years. So after two years, Hassan Hoja said to Hamid Aitach, I think I'm going to give up because I don't think I'm talented enough. And I he said, oh, no, no, I just thought you wanted more detail. Oh, all right. And then from that point on, Hassan Hoja would actually pass the lessons himself when he saw he had less than four mistakes because Hamid, he, for him, it could always be better. You see, there's always room for improvement. So this shows you several things. One, the difficulty of the art of calligraphy. Two, the submission of the student towards the teacher. Mm -hmm. which is so important. And here you see a sort of typical example of a calligraphy class with a teacher. In this case, is uh, my master, Daud Bektash, correcting the mesh, and all of the students looking on, and nobody's writing. Everybody's paying attention to every single... Remember the first poem, the first saying of Sheikh Hamdullah, where you say, you fix your hands on the hand of the teacher, on what he's saying, on what he's correcting. And you need to think that at that time there were no iPhones, and no video cameras to record. So really, when we are in the presence of our teachers, we take every moment, every breath, every opportunity to really observe and, and absorb as much as we can from, from their knowledge. So when the student is practicing at home, what does the student do? A karalama, meaning you blacken the page. And obviously due to the, 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 the precious nature of paper, traditionally, these are old examples from the 19th century, but all calligraphy students should have similar examples of just filling the page and practicing, practicing, practicing. And it's very much like any traditional art. It's not only calligraphy. I mean, ballet dancers or musicians, you have to repeat, repeat, repeat. And it's through that repetition and through that discipline that you will finally advance in your practice and in, in your knowledge. After the Rabbi Yasser, the students will write the letters of the alphabet. And, sorry, I didn't mention, this is what the student does when he or she is alone at home. But when you 
show it to your teacher. It should be extremely clean, centered, you know, really in the, the best way possible, out of respect for your teacher as well. And you would never show this uh, to one of your, your, your teachers. So, and here you see the corrections in red. And obviously this was a, a lesson that had to be repeated. This is an example, an older example that shows you the letters of the, of the alphabet, meaning the, the main calligraphic forms. And the measuring noctas, the point, are in circles just to make it more easy to, to distinguish the actual calligraphic form. But traditionally, it would be done with a column. And we have, after the alphabet, the student then starts learning the connections of the letters. This is a very old example by Yakut al-Mustasemi from the 13th century in Baghdad. And you see already what we call the Mufredat, meaning Jim connected to Aleph, Jim uh, Ba, Jim Jim, Jim Dal, Jim Ra. Yeah, it's a little bit of the solfege, the, the musical scales of calligraphy. And this will go on for every single letter. So you will learn the connections of the initial form with the final form. And I've put different examples from different periods, so you see the continuity throughout the centuries. This is from Tabriz, 16th century in Iran. Once a student has passed this phase of the, the Mufredat, they will start writing sentences. They will firstly write another prayer saying, I finished the Mufredat with the aid of God, going back to the first prayer. And then they will start writing sentences, which in the Ottoman tradition, they are largely religious sayings sayings of the prophet, hadith, prayers. And then later, you will start writing the Quranic texts. But really, it's what comes much, much, much later. You would not, for instance, uh, we were speaking earlier about this. A student today came and asked me to write the word of God, Allah. And um, she's just started calligraphy. Uh, it's her second day. <laughs> and so I said, I didn't write the word of God until, I don't know, five years after, or maybe four years. No, it takes really a very long time before you can be worthy of, of writing such an important. Here we have an example of a sentence with the corrections of the teacher and an older example with the corrections by Camelactic in the same ink. But you can see they're both in black, but wherever you see the noctas, the little measuring points, those are the indications of the teacher and the corrections. So... This is another example of a calligraphy class with wonderful uh, master Mohammed Zakaria in the U.S. And the students, as you can see, everybody's looking on, trying to absorb as much as they can. So with time, once the, the students have written the Mufredat, once they've done a series of sentences, then they will do a very long poem called the Aleph Kassidesi, where each sentence starts with a letter of the alphabet. And then they will start combining different texts and writing, what we call kita, which is a combination of the two styles, in this case, Tuluth and Nesir. And here you have a good example of the student's work and the teacher's corrections. And then after this long period, which for the Mufredat we can say minimum one year, but sometimes longer, normally longer, for sentences also, and the Aleph Kassidesi, a few years, the student will gradually go to larger sizes. Huh? And they will start getting a larger column and making compositions and creating new pieces. For the Nastalik style, which is another script written in the Ottoman school, and obviously it comes from Iran, it's a central script in the Iranian tradition. Nowadays, it's interesting because they, the way they teach it in Iran is that the students have become so immersed in Nastalik, which is everywhere you go, that they don't start with a mufredat, they start with sentences. I don't think I have the one I wanted to... Ah, yes, adab, adab, darad, more or less. So they start with sentences that are extremely simple. The first sentence that all the students write is adab, adab, darad, meaning the adab, right comportment, has its own rules. This is the first sentence. And then they will get gradually more complex the first sentence has no connections, all the letters. There are words that have no connections in the letters. And then gradually, it will start getting more and more uh, complicated. This is an example of an astalic lesson with the corrections as well by the teacher. 
And then, obviously, the student continues working on different compositions. Up to a certain point, the student is only copying. And then after quite a few years, the student will start making their own compositions. Up to the moment where the teacher decides that it's a moment for the ijaza. So what is the ijaza? Traditionally, in the Ottoman school, it is a text a text that has been written previously by one of the old masters of the, let's say, the silsila, the chain of transmission, the Ottoman chain of transmission, and they will try to reproduce this text as closely as possible. And if the teacher finds that this is worthy uh, of being the ijaza, they will say, all right, this is your ijaza, and they will sign, and here you can see the two signatures by the two teachers of this student. So the first part is the reproduction by the student of this text. And the second part is the signature saying, this person is my student, I am the student of so-and-so, and and this person may now have, well, it gives the permission to sign their own works and also teach. So it's really the chain and the silsila. Once you receive your ijazah, you belong to this chain of transmission that goes back to Sayyidina Ali, the son-in-law of the Prophet. And the ijaza tradition, this is an example of an ijaza in Nastalik, has undergone different phases. There was a point in Turkey at the beginning of the 20th century where they established the Madrasul Khatatin, which was a big calligraphy, a calligraphers school. And they started to give very official certificates and there were exams. They would give different certificates for every single script. This is an example of the ijaza of Halim Osjaiji, one of the teachers of Hassan Chalabi. And then with change of, well, with, with the Turkish Republic and the changing of the alphabet, this of course was all put aside and the calligraphers went back to the traditional older ijaza system, huh? the ones that we've just seen here. However, in Iran, the same concept started also around the middle of the 20th century And what they do in Iran, which I think is very good, is they have a system of national exams where in every single town there is, let's say, a a representative of the Anjoman Khoshnevisan, who is the National Institute of Calligraphers. And somebody will come from Tehran to every single town on the same day to give the national exam for calligraphy. And they have different levels. So at the time they had four levels. They had... Uh, intermediate, good, very good, excellent. Now they keep adding levels because (laughs) there's an immense amount of teachers and students and so on. And now they even give the level to master, meaning this person has studied all these levels. They have done so many exhibitions. They have produced so many books and so many pieces. And then this is the Ustadi level, which I think perhaps in Turkey they should consider doing this as well. Precisely because we have such an amount of new, there's a sort of renewed interest in the arts of calligraphy. There are many more teachers and many more students in the last 10 years than 20 years ago. So, uh, you know, with the, the, it's a bit of the the sign of uh, quantity. (laughs) So we do need a little bit more of, to establish the, the rigorous benchmarks for the art of calligraphy. This is another example of Ijaza, and here you see the signature of the three masters, which means the students studied, perhaps they started with one master and continued with their master, and it's always following the same silsila, the same transmission chain. But the most important thing I would like to say to, to all students is that the Ijaza is definitely not the end. It is only one small step in the journey of the calligrapher and of the student. We are all students throughout our lives until we die. And we always try as much as we can to continue the relationship with our teachers. And this is a very beautiful picture of Hassan Chalevi, one of my teachers, with Mohamed Zekeria, who's also one of my teachers, and his student. And another picture of Ustada Mirhani in Iran with Master Bahman Panahi, another one of his students. And as you can see, Bahman Panahi started with his teacher when he was 14 years old. And here they are. Every time uh, they see each other, they're still learning and they're still... The transmission continues. So 
after this moment of the jaza, and this is sometimes a, a, a question that is asked, how do we achieve mastery? No? How do you go from copying, because that's what the student does for many years, you're just copying, copying, copying. How do you go to creating? No? Can you create or are you just copying still? So here I'm going to backtrack a little bit, and I don't want to get too histor historical, but there is something that happens in the traditional and the classical calligraphy, which is, up to the 17th century, what did calligraphers do, in your opinion? What was their main, what did they produce? All right, the Quran and? Letters for people. Letters for people? No, that would be a katib, that would be a copyist. Yeah, a calligrapher wouldn't do a letter, for, um, maybe for the king, <laughs> for the sultan, he would get his calligrapher. But even there, you had a hierarchy of the khatat, meaning the calligrapher, and then you had the scribes who did sort of the, the everyday, very beautiful writing, but it didn't have the same category. Yeah. Mosques? All right, mosques, architecture, all right. You, you see, it's not clear. This is what I realized, that for me it's very clear because I'm a calligrapher, but for people it's not so clear what do calligraphers do. So, for, of course, centuries, the initial need of using calligraphy is to write down the Quran. So that's central, and that has continued up to this day. But, since we going back, three continents, 13 centuries, many different languages written with Arabic. So obviously we're going to write more things. Poetry, mystical treatises, of course, writing that is then going to be applied onto different surfaces on the mosques, and something else, which is the topic of my thesis, <laughs> and here we go, which is something that arises from the need of creating a sacred space. We will get there. So if you see the space of a typical Turkish mosque, it is an enclosed space. Hmm? If you see a mosque, a typically Iranian mosque with the four iwans, extremely open, vast spaces where really you have the presence of heaven and it's very, very uh, open, it's a completely different experience than going to one of these mosques. So I've thought a lot about this and one of the things that is somehow comes together is this space and the calligraphic panel, meaning the presence of calligraphy as a panel which acts very much as an icon. And we can analyze, we can say, oh, it's a Byzantine influence or this or that, but be it as it may, it's something that is purely Ottoman. It starts with the Ottoman uh, school and it has been imported into other parts of the Islamic world. And the first calligraphic panels were actually in the tekes, in the Sufi lodges. And this is where we find, uh, I'm sorry about the quality of the picture, but if you see all these little framed pieces, these are all pieces of calligraphy which are framed, you see. So from the 17th century, we have the printing press and we have many religious books that start being printed and so on. The calligraphers gradually go from the book gradually towards the calligraphic album, which continues to this day, very beautiful albums with poems, prayers, and so on, and the levha, the calligraphic panel. And this is a very good example of a small mosque in Istanbul, 1935, filled with levhas everywhere. So who produced these levhas? Levhas means mobile calligraphic panel, yeah? Who produces calligraphers? Calligraphers, some of them highly professional calligraphers, some of them less professional. And today, most calligraphers, what we do is we produce these sorts of pieces that are going to be hung on the wall. So when you hang one of these pieces, oops, what happened here? Aha, uh -huh. and here you have even one more step. We go from the teke, the Sufi lodge, to the mosque, and in the 19th century, they start being hung in the walls of houses, very much like a work of art. So when we have this relationship of calligraphy framed 
it goes also from the role of calligraphy as an icon, which is an extremely important aspect, I would say the most important aspect, the sacred nature of the calligraphy. When you see it, it reminds you of the sacred, it reminds you of the word of God. But also, I mean, in this, this is a good picture to see this for this person. The calligraphy is also a work of art next to the, I don't know, impressionist uh, painting of the Bosphor, hmm? Bosphorus. And another type of calligraphic panel, which became extremely popular after the 17th century, is the Hylia. The Hylia is a sort of calligraphic icon describing the qualities of the prophet. And we have hundreds, not to say thousands, of Hylias that were written by calligraphers. And it became a very strong Ottoman calligrapher to have a helia hanging in the house. And here, really, I mean, it's literally an icon with two doors that close. And then they would open it for special occasions for the mauluds and the different religious. Uh, they would normally light a candle. And we have some very beautiful accounts of how the person, the viewer, visits the helia. It's a sort of ziara every time they open the helia. And here you have another example of Alefa hanging exactly as a painting in the Thuluth script and the jelly variety of script. So this detour that I've, that I've done is to explain why when we produce um, a piece of calligraphy, sometimes uh, students have a notion that we produce, that we write, that we would write something like this very quickly. Know that because we're such wonderful calligraphers, we just breathe in, breathe out, take our kalam, and just do this. No? However, this is really not the case, especially in the Ottoman school. We might find this way of practicing calligraphy more in Iran and in the eastern parts of the Islamic world. However, in the Ottoman school, precisely because of this sort of the, the, the nature of the calligraphy as an icon and the nature of the calligraphy as a work of art, makes it a, a sort of uh, an extremely refined process of production. So, for instance, in order to write a piece, this would be a very simple, <laughs> this is one of my sketches, but you see here, it's a completely, how should you say, I mean, it's a sketch. Yeah, it's a work in progress. And this is actually after maybe five more pieces with a smaller column, scribbling, changing, altering, and deciding how you're going to put everything. Then you take a large column and you work on this sketch. Then you keep working on it and you keep refining and you keep correcting and you keep altering, you keep adding, taking away. Then you decide where you're going to put all the hareke, eh? the decorations, the vowels, and so on. And then you write the final piece. But everything has been decided. And this process is a process of creating what they call the kalib. Kalib means template. Hmm? And of course, going back to this, I, mean, I know it looks terrible, but you cannot do this without having done the previous 10 years of copying, 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 copying. And then you start thinking, once you've, completely absorbed the principles, you've absorbed the aesthetic, you absorb the proportions, then you start putting everything together for a new composition that no one has done before. No one has written the Muhammad with this elongated kishida and the meme and the dal and so on. However, when you look at it, for you, you would think, oh, this is a completely classical piece of calligraphy. Hmm? And this is an old example by Mustafa Halim Ozdiaji, 20th century. You see the kalib and you see the final piece. And question, how do they go from the kalib to the final piece? Any ideas? No? Do you think they put it up and then they copy it like this freehand? No. There's a system of transferring, which is extremely old, and we have this even in miniature, where they would pierce with a needle the corners of the letters to have 
It's a template. Then they transfer this to a final, the final paper, and they would rub it with, with chalk or with uh, ash, depending on the color of the surface. They lift it, so you have more or less the outline of the letters. Once you have this outline, obviously, for, for someone who is not a calligrapher, you can have all the outlines in the world, and if you take the column, you will not be able to, you still need the steady hand, you need the train, you need everything. But it's just to show you the importance given to the precision and the refinement of the final piece. So when a calligrapher produces a piece, uh, there were calligraphers who would take maybe months to create the calip. And then after many months, Sami Effendi, he was known for taking, I don't know, three months for one calip. And then he would very painstakingly pierce every single part of the letter and produce the final piece. The same calip could be used to be applied to architecture. We have a lot of, some of the most famous pieces by Sami Effendi were applied onto architecture, fountains and so on. So now, uh, just to give you an example of how the classical, the classical, um, here's a classical basmala. Basmala is, is the, one of the most famous formulas, which is the formula with, with which Muslims start every action and starts every surah in the Quran, Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of, of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. So the Basmala has been written, you can imagine, for centuries. However, the amazing thing is that calligraphers can still find new ways of writing the Basmala. So this is a very classical example of what we call the Oklu Basmala. is the Basmala that is elongated. Ok means um, arrow. And then this is another possibility of writing the Basmala. And here yet again, based on this example, you have all these other possibilities. Now, when you look at it, it all looks the same. But if you start looking, you will see for instance, where they placed the top part of the gym, some people moved it a little bit to the left, some a little bit to the right, a little bit higher, a little bit longer. And this is what actually makes the composition completely original to each calligrapher who writes it. Yet another possibility of the basmala. And you see the elongated olives, the pyramidal olives in the center, and also the right-hand corner. And these are all, in this case, by contemporary calligraphers, eh? Muhammad Ozje, Mehmed Ozje, Hassan Chalevi. Yet another example. Here the letters become curved. We have Osman Ozje, Daud Bektash. Eh? This is from 2009. Yet another example of the Muthanna, Musanna, the mirror imaging which another question students often ask is, how, how do I do a musenna? <laughs> so now that you know about the calip, the template, now it gives you an idea of how they do the musenna. Yet another example with a circular bismi, the letter seen elongated around the central composition. The bismillah in a square form and what we also have, the zoomorphic calligraphy, which also became very popular in the Ottoman school and also has important ties to Sufism. And you see how the basmala is inside the tail of the stork. And this is obviously, I mean, it's also a virtuous exercise by the calligraphers. It's a little bit the calligraphers having, you would not, normally you would not find this, for instance, in a mosque. No, this is more... <laughs> The, the, the calligraphers really playing with the, with the calligraphy and with the letters and so on. Another example by Osman Ozje, we're still with the same sentence. Hmm? And this is contemporary. So imagine if I had put for you the 13th centuries of Basmalas. And in one style, because we have many different styles, so one style. Here we, we jump styles a little bit. The Tura, 
which you probably have seen, it's become uh, sort of the symbol of Ottoman uh, Ottomanness. <laughs> is uh, this is a signature of the Sultan Suleiman? So this is by Daoud Bektash. He takes exactly the same graphic elements and makes the basmala. You see the bismi on the right, the Rahman Rahim, and the Allah is the actual shape of the Tura. So this is an excellent example of a very classical piece, but completely creative. I don't want to use the word modern because I, I don't like modern things, but it shows you how it's, um, it's extremely new and extremely classical, extremely proportioned and beautiful. And finally, Abbas Mala, which I would like to ask you, when do you think this is from? Far East, 16th century. Ah, all right, so you, you know, you know. Because <laughs> sometimes when students see this, they, they see it as a very new contemporary composition. But yes, Ahmad Karahisari, 16th, 16th century. And it's from a manuscript book kept at the Islamic Arts Museum in Istanbul. <coughs> However, this Musal Selvas Mala was, it predates Ahmad Karahisari. And we found, I found recently in a mosque of Tabriz, the walls were filled with this uh, Musal Selvas Mala. And in the Timurid albums, it's also very much present. But he took it definitely to a new level. It's become quite famous. So this just leads me to the last part of, of the talk. A lot has been said about geometry in calligraphy. And of course, whenever you have points, lines, and proportions, there's always geometry. But there's one uh, aspect, which I think is much more important, and that is what the Persians call the shan, or the makam of a piece. So what does this mean? You can have a piece which is perfectly proportional and perfectly well made, and it will be completely flat, and it won't do anything for you. And there are pieces which will also be at a high technique level, but maybe a little bit off-center or a little bit through. Not necessarily. It can be of the highest possible level or maybe not so high, but there will be a very strong energy and something that will draw you towards this piece. So this is, I mean, now, it, yeah, we can say energy, shan in Persian or makam. is the state of the piece. So according to the sensitivity of the viewer, they will perceive this or not. And I've seen often when we've organized exhibits in, in, in places in the West, I remember organizing an exhibit in Spain with the great masters from Turkey. They, they came and all their, exhibits were, uh, all their pieces were exhibited. The people who came to the exhibit had never seen Islamic calligraphy. They had never, but they were all drawn to certain pieces more than others. And that is that can only be explained by this aspect, a very intangible aspect of the makam of the piece. So, of course, as an artist, how do you capture this makam? How do you make this a part of your work? And <laughs> there is no answer. It's either there or it's not. And the only thing we can say, perhaps, perhaps, because I don't know the answer, is right intention, the correct way of writing, no? knowing all the rules, going back to the initial poem. And then something else that happens that is what in the West sometimes they call the muses, <laughs> the inspiration, and all these different elements, which of course are very difficult to, to pin down, but are a very important aspect of calligraphy and of any art. Um, so I would like to remember the words by Master Sultan Ali Mashadi, from the 16th century, who says, he who knows the soul knows that purity of writing proceeds from purity of heart. And I think it's a very way of encapsulating uh, what the art of calligraphy finally is all about. And coming back to the initial qualities of the calligrapher, the poem that we saw at the beginning, precisely I, I became aware of this poem when I visited Ustad Amir Khani in, in Tehran, and I asked him, I said, what are the qualities needed to be a good calligrapher? And he said, well, you know, Pan Chisa has, he started reciting the poem. 
He said, and apart from this poem, um, there is one element without which is impossible to continue. And what do you think that is? I'm hearing in- intention. One element that is the driving force for everything. Inspiration. Hmm? Inspiration. Inspiration, yes. And how do you get inspired? When you love. Pray. When you love. And he said that is the most important element. Love. And he didn't use... He didn't say love, the normal love. He said ashk, eh? intense love. And there's a very famous Turkish saying that all calligraphers repeat all the time, saying ashk olmadan meshk olmaz, meaning without this intense love, you have no meshk. Meshk is a word for lessons, for the practice of calligraphy.